Hello and welcome to another virtual program from Maine Historical Society. I'm Kathleen Newman. It is November 16th, 2023, and this is Tragic Betrayal, the story of Robert Perry and Minnick Wallace, a talk with Genevieve Lemoyne. And this talk is brought to you as part of our series on Code Red, our exhibit on climate justice and natural history collections. For those of you that haven't yet had a chance to see Code Red, that'll be open through the end of this year. So the last day to visit is December 30th, 2023, and the MHS galleries are open, excuse me, <clears throat> Tuesday through Saturday, uh, 10 a.m. to 5 p.m. You can learn more and you can even buy your tickets online if you visit our website, mainhistory.org. Before we go any further, I just want to take a moment uh, as we kind of think about ourselves uh, in the place that we're in and in the time that we're in. And remember that Maine Historical Society recognizes that what is currently referred to as Maine is Wabanaki homelands, a place the Wabanaki people have stewarded for over 13,000 years. Wherever we are in Maine, we are on Wabanaki homelands, and we recognize the inherent sovereignty of the Abenaki, Maliseet, Mi'kmaq, Passamaquoddy, and Penobscot nations within these lands and waters. Understanding Wabanaki history is vital to understanding Maine, and we are committed to helping provide education about this history through partnerships with Wabanaki people. And in fact, our Code Red exhibit is a really good example of one of those partnerships. Joining us this evening uh, is Genevieve Lemoyne. She is the curator and registrar, registrar, excuse me, of the Perry McMillan Arctic Museum and Arctic Studies Center at Bowdoin College. She has a PhD in archaeology from the University of Calgary and has conducted archaeological research on a variety of prehistoric and historic sites in the Canadian Arctic and Greenland. She is the co-author with Susan Kaplan of Perry's Arctic Quest, Untold Stories from Robert E. Perry's North Pole Expeditions. And she uh, joins us tonight to talk about uh, Robert Perry and Minnick, Minnick Wallace. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Genevieve, for being here with us this evening. Well, thank you for having me and for that lovely introduction. And I'll just share my screen because I'm sure there's You'd rather be looking at, so you can see the opening screen here. Okay. Yep, that so, looks good. Much better than looking at me. So, all right. And thank you for that introduction and also for that lovely um, acknowledgement that we're on Wabanaki land. I, of course, I'm sitting here on Wabanaki land as well. And I would also like to acknowledge the people of Greenland where I do my research and where a good deal of this story takes place and where Minnick Wallace was born. Um, they have done, uh, had an outsized role in polar exploration and they have not been recognized enough for that role. Um, so let's start talking though about one particular member of that community, Minnick Wallace. Um, you can see him here in his kayak at Umanak, which may be more familiar to you as uh, the Thule Air Base, uh, now renamed Petufik Air Base. Uh, to given, re, given the Americans have given it back its Greenlandic name, but for most people, it would be most familiar as Thule. Um, and, and this is Minnick in a kayak in 1914, looking happy and as looking like a typical Inuit hunter, but his life was anything but typical. Um, Minnick was born in 1891 in Greenland. You see him here in the middle as a small child. His father here, Kisuk, and his mother, Manik. This is him as a baby. She's carrying him in her amauti. Um, Manik sadly died when he was a small child, and so Kisuk was raising him uh, by himself. He was a smart, very active child. Um, Kisuk worked for Peary as a dog sled driver and as a hunter in the 1890s. Um, and Peary has some amusing stories about uh, Minnick as a little boy, kind of mischievous, but also for a five-year-old, pretty accomplished with his little bow and arrow. 
Uh, so he was he was an active, happy child. Um, and he was interacting from a very early age with Robert Peary and with other um, Americans on his expeditions. Just to give you a little bit of orientation of where we're talking about, here we are here down in Maine. The area we're talking about is in Northwestern Greenland, the Smith Sound region. You can see it enlarged here. Thule, Umanak, uh, where I, we just looked at the picture of Minnick there is here. This is where the Thule Air Base is. We'll also be talking about Cape York, which is actually a little bit off the bottom of this slide. Um, we'll talk briefly about Hanak, which is the main community in this region today. And uh, the other important area up here for this story, although it doesn't come into it so much tonight, is Ita. It still shows up on maps. It's a long abandoned, but very important Inuit settlement. So those are the, the kinds of places that we're, we're talking about here that may not be familiar to you. So the story is very much about Minnick, but other people play an important role. And chief among them is Robert Peary. Uh, Peary, as many of you probably know, started working in the Arctic in 18, well, in Northern Greenland in 1891. Um, he overwintered in 1891-92, then again in 93 and 94, and he was up there in the summer, other summers in the 1890s, before he began his real push to get to the North Pole in the early years of the 20th century. Um, he had a large impact on that community, some good, some not so good. Uh, he was often, almost always, in fact, accompanied on those expeditions by this man, Matthew Henson, who plays a small, and, and unfortunately, we don't know enough about what kind of a role he played in Minnick's story, but he certainly knew Minnick um, as he knew most of the people in the community. Uh, Matthew Henson was uh, in the community. He was much more integrated into the community than Peary was. Peary kind of... Uh, placed himself as a leader in the community. Uh, he was definitely an outsider. He was a person who was respected and trusted, but also feared. And um, he wasn't, he was not a, a friendly face in a lot of ways to people in the community. Matthew Henson, on the other hand, was very much um, admired and respected and loved in the community. He was much more fluent in the language than Peary was. He was, considered much more one of them than Peary ever was. He was a, um, a key intermediary really for Peary between the Inuit, the people of Northwestern Greenland and this American who was coming into their community over and over again. Uh, Peary on many of his expeditions collected lots of things for museums and you can go see two of them in code red right now. There are um, this beautiful partial narwhal skull and tusk, and this walrus skull with its also dramatic tusks. Um, he gave these to the Portland Natural History Society. Um, they now belong, when the, that collection was disbanded, they ended up here at, uh, at Bowdoin, at, at our museum, but they're currently on loan at Code Red, and I definitely encourage you to go see them where they've arranged them as they had been arranged in Portland. These are just, these are a drop in the bucket for the kinds of and quantity of material that Peary brought back with him from these expeditions, a lot of which he sold to museums, um, some of which was given to donors or natural history societies as, as donations. The expedition that is of key importance for us tonight was one that happened in 1897. It was a summer expedition and its purpose was to go and get this meteorite. This is a big steel, it's iron and nickel meteorite, uh, part of a complex of meteorite fragments that uh, are found at Cape York at the Southern end of, of this area that we looked at on the map. And Peary had brought two smaller pieces back in previous expeditions. And then he went up and with a great deal of effort and some very skillful engineering, they got this giant piece of iron out of the ground onto a ship and back to New York, um, where ultimately he sold it for about forty or fifty thousand dollars to the American Museum of Natural History. And you can still go see it. It's there in the basement. It's got supports that go all the way down to the bedrock of um, Manhattan. 
to keep it stable within the museum and it but it's still there as are the other fragments of it um so when they came back with this meteorite that was big news but the other news was also that he had brought back six Inuit, six people from the community in northern Greenland back to New York. And you can see them here. They are Nutak, his wife, Atagana. Here's Minik, Minik's father, Kisuk. This is um, Aviak, who's Atagana's daughter. And this is Wisa Kasak, a young, another, a young man, a single young man. Uh, the white man here, this guy, is Albert Aperti, who was an artist who was on the expedition. So here are six people from very far away coming to New York in 1897. Um, and their arrival came as somewhat of a surprise, although it was not a total surprise. Uh, the other person who plays a big role in this story is this man, Franz Boas, who was an assistant curator at that time of the American Museum of Natural History. Boaz is a very interesting and a, an important person. He is um, considered to be in many ways the father of American anthropology. He spent uh, a year in the 1880s working with Inuit on Baffin Island and published a very um, one of the first ethnographies of Inuit called the Central Eskimo, which you can still is still in print. I think you can still buy it. Um, and he had some really important, he had a real important influence on American anthropology. He was, for instance, um, a big opponent of some of the prevalent ideas in uh, academic thought in those days. He was very much against scientific racism and he worked very hard to show that um, all people basically were equal and that the, the kind of, quasi-scientific arguments that people were making to justify racism in those days were false. He was also a big opponent of the idea, the ideas in, in those days of cultural evolution, the idea that Western society was the apex of a progression, an evolutionary progression of societies, and that every society other than Western industrial society was inferior. And he argued strongly against that idea. And those are very important formative ideas for uh, American anthropology, and they really were revolutionary in many ways at that time. Not He wasn't always as forward-thinking as we might like, and he made some missteps in his career. One of them was um, at the Chicago World's Fair. He was at that point at uh, working in Chicago, and he was tasked with developing a section of the World Fair that would showcase the people of the world, the indigenous people of the world. Um, he brought, among other groups of people, this large group of Inuit from Labrador down, and they lived on the fairgrounds and did regular demonstrations for fairgoers to watch them as they, and you can actually find online films of them doing cracking their whips and riding their dog sleds and doing things that are very, very early film. Um, Boaz thought this would be very educational for people. He was rather dismayed to discover that most of the fairgoers saw it simply as entertainment. Um, and in general, this idea of exhibiting people was in his mind then a thing of the past. It had been quite common to put humans from other cultures on exhibit in the 19th century. Um, and he was, he sort of caught the tail end of that. And I think this, um, this experience soured him on that. But in 18, the 1890s, when he was in New York, he wrote to Peary and he said, the next time you go to Greenland, perhaps you could bring south a middle-aged man who could spend a winter with us here at the museum and we could learn from him about his culture. Uh, I don't know that Peary ever responded to him in writing, but he did indeed respond to him with people, bringing people back to the museum. The, he brought six people back. Peary also had experience bringing other people back previous to this. And so in 1893, Josephine Peary, his wife, who was heavily pregnant, sailed with him to Northern Greenland to overwinter. 
1893-1894, and their daughter Marie was born in September in northern Greenland and had her first, you know, grew up for the first nine months of her life in Greenland. And they sailed south in the summer of 1894. And with them came this young woman, Ekara Yusak, who Josephine and Marie called Miss Bill. And Ekara Yusak spent a year in Philadelphia with Josephine. She was not put on display. She lived in the house as a guest, um, perhaps helping a little bit with baby Marie. Uh, she didn't go to school. Her English was not good enough for that, but she lived just as a member of the family. Peary was still in Greenland, so she was not living with, the family was not complete. It was Josephine and Marie and Bill and Josephine's mother, I think. Um, and then in 1895, sorry, I got the years wrong. It's 18, yeah, 1895. She went back to Greenland. The ship that was going to fetch Peary brought her back to her home and she was reunited with her family. Having spent, we don't know whether it was a happy year or not for her. We don't know that much about how she felt her experience went, um, but it was a successful trip in the sense that she went, she experienced new things, she went back home. Once she got back home, uh, she didn't really talk about her experiences. Uh, the, the stories that we hear today are that people really didn't believe her when she talked about big buildings and, excuse me, you know, horses and carriages and all the kinds of modern trains, the modern things that she would have seen. And people just thought those things were too fantastic to be believed. And so she got tired of being uh, told she was making things up and she absolutely refused to talk about her experiences for most of her life. Um, but she went on to have a perfectly happy life in Northern Greenland. So Peary had had an experience of one person coming down quite successfully. And somehow then he interpreted Boaz's request to bring one person down in a very different way. And he brought all of these six people here. And here they are photographed on the deck of the ship in New York in October, 1897. Um, it's really hard to know why he brought so many people. I do know that he he had already learned that just taking one man away from his family for any extended period of time was a bad idea because then there was no one to hunt for the family and that was a, a real hardship. Obviously someone like Kisuk, who you see here, who had a, no wife and his child, you could, not, you could hardly separate them. Um, but why all six of them, we really, really don't know. Some of them may have been eager to go. Wiesakak, in particular, as a single man, would have been a good candidate um, to come by himself. Um, but he came very late on and I think tagged on with the rest of them. Uh, Peary was never clear on why so many of them came. But I don't think he didn't force them into coming. Uh, I think perhaps because of Ekar Yusak's experience, perhaps they thought it would be a fun adventure. It's hard to know. But nevertheless, they all arrived there in October of 1896. The first thing that happened when they got there is Peary, um, he had the meteorite on board as well, which was very newsworthy, and he sold tickets. And tens of thousands of people in the first couple of days that they were in New York bought tickets so they could go on board the ship and see these people and the meteorite. Um, so Peary appeared to have no qualms about putting people on exhibit and charging for the, the, uh, the privilege. We don't know what he did with the money, uh, but he certainly, somebody made a good deal of, of money just in those few days of people coming on board the ship. At the museum, the American Museum of Natural History, there was a little bit of consternation because they had no idea that six people were coming and being delivered to them as their responsibility, which is what was, which is what Peary's understanding was. Once they got to New York, he basically washed his hands of them and, and really never raised a finger to help them after that. They went to the museum. The first thing that happened is that they were given rooms to live in in the basement of the museum because they hadn't prepared any space because they weren't expecting them. Um, 
they were not really put on exhibit. There were uh, newspaper accounts talk about scores of people, not hundreds, but scores of people uh, being allowed to visit them in the basement, but many, many other people being denied access to them. So they weren't, the museum was not actively um, exhibiting them as far as we know. And they did what they could for them. They um, eventually found rooms for them on the upper floors of the building and during the time they were there, they even moved them out of the museum and even eventually um, out of New York so that they could be out of the city. Because almost as soon as they got there, they started getting sick. Um, what began as a cold soon turned to pneumonia um, and then eventually to tuberculosis. When they were at the museum, they did, you know, Boaz's idea that they would work with museum staff to talk about their culture. The museum followed through with that. And this man, Alfred Krober, was the one who was responsible for most of that work. And he published um, uh, in the Bulletin of the American Museum of Natural History an extensive description of them and what he had learned of their customs and descriptions of their material culture, their clothing, their tools, and things like that, which, you know, at the time was considered a very important piece of scholarship. And Kroeber himself, again, went on to become a very important person in American anthropology. Um, he does, though, bear some responsibility for uh, what happened afterwards. He was aware that they were getting sick. They were often, in fact, in and out of the hospital. Um, and in February, so they arrived in October, in February, Kisuk, Minnick's father, sorry, get my mouse back here, Minnick's father, in February, Kisuk died of tuberculosis, the first of them to pass away. Um, Minnick was distraught, of course, he was an orphan by that point since his mother, his mother had already passed away. Um, they performed a funeral for his father um, and then went on working with the others who were again continuing to fall ill. Um, Atagana died in March. Nutak died in, sorry, this is Atagana. Nutak died in May, shortly, followed shortly afterwards by Aviak. So four people had at, by that point passed away in the short time that they were there. By that point, they were living out in the country on a farm, but it wasn't really helping. And so Risa Kasak moved from the farm to be on board the ship, the Windward, which was going to take him and Peary back north. Uh, Matthew Henson was on board the ship making preparations for the journey. He, of course, he knew Risa Kak, Risa, sorry, Risa Kasak, um, he could speak to him in his own language. And so he lived on the ship until they sailed back to Greenland and he was home again in the summer of 1898. Minnick was not sent back home. It's not at all clear why he was not sent back home, but in fact, he was adopted by uh, William Wallace, who was the superintendent of the museum and his wife. They had a son about Minnick's age and they adopted Minnick into their family. He became, for a little while, kind of a um, a darling of the media. So there were extensive, numerous articles about him in the paper talking about how this little orphan was adapting to life in the United States. He would be occasionally posed in his traditional clothing. You can see here, this clo clothing is much, much too big for him. It, big for him. It was not the clothing that he came south in. He'd probably by that point outgrown his original clothing and they were putting him in one of the other men's clothing because this is much, much too big for him. Um, he looks much more comfortable, in fact, with his bicycle uh, standing. This is at Wallace's farm in upstate New York. Uh, he and Wallace's son got along great and had, in fact, a fairly idyllic childhood for a lot, a lot of that time. We find newspaper reports about him um, playing baseball on the school team, uh, participating in citywide skating races and coming in third, I think, because somebody tripped him. Uh, you know, he, he was, 
the media was paying attention to him and but he was having a relatively normal american childhood uh not at all what his parents would have expected of him but not a bad time uh the wallaces loved him they treated him just like his own son um they did get some support for him particularly from morris k jessup who was the director of the museum of natural history um and things were going along fine they started to fall apart a little bit in around the turn of the century when the american museum discovered that wallace William Wallace had embezzled lots of money. And so he was fired um, and turned out to be in great debt. So he lost the farm where, where Minnick and, and um, his stepbrother had enjoyed tramping through the woods and things like that. They went and lived in a small apartment in New York City and they were uh, kind of had called kind of fallen on hard times. But nevertheless, it appears to have been a close and relatively happy family. Unfortunately, that didn't last. In 1907, Minnick, he was in school, in high school, um, and a newspaper in New York broke the story that his father, his father's bones were in the collections of the American Museum of Natural History. And it's not clear whether they were actually on exhibit or not, but they were certainly in the hands of the American Museum. Um, now, you remember I told you that Minnick had gone to his father's funeral. It turns out that the funeral was a complete sham, and Boaz knew it, and Krober knew it, Wallace certainly knew it, they all knew it. The museum, learning that Minnick, even as a, he was only seven at the time, knowing that he expected a funeral for his father, and Krober had learned from the others what a Inuit funeral would look like. They took a log and wrapped that in clothing and furs and pretended that that was Kisuk's body and demonstrably buried it for a minute so that he could experience his father's burial. In fact, what they had done was taken his body to Bellevue Hospital where there was an autopsy performed, his brain was removed and preserved so that for further study, and ultimately his bones were cleaned and added to the museum's collection. The same was true of the other three who died. Their bones were all added to the museum's collection and stored there in the museum. Now, as you might expect, Minnick, who's a teenager by this point and a fairly well-educated young man, when he didn't go off the rails. He went, he got angry, very, very angry. He petitioned and lobbied for the museum to return the bones of his father um, completely unsuccessfully. He, the media, the, me, the newspapers at that time were extremely sensationalist. And so you can see here these two, uh, two newspaper pages, this one from Chicago, this one from Detroit. The story was syndicated all the way across the country. Um, it was, you know, it was very much sensationalized. You see here they talk about Mene, the Eskimo boy who came south as a guest of the nation, tells how he has been vivisected in the U.S. Vivisected, which means a live dissection. Of course, he was not in any sense dissected or operated around on, but he was very much emotionally abused, lied to. Um, and he felt very strongly betrayed by the museum and also by Peary. When the museum was refusing to return his father's bones to him for burial, he appealed to Peary for help. And Peary, as he had done all this time, basically ignored him. He refused to give him any help at all. Um, the newspapers ate that up. Peary was always a controversial figure. Um, and so this is from... 1908, I think, you know, claiming that Eskimo wants Eskimo boy, of course, this is a newspaper, so they're using those antiquated terms, wants to shoot Peary. Um, and perhaps he did say that. It's not, we'll never know whether he really said he wanted to shoot him or not, but he really, really did feel that strongly that Peary owed him some kind of help. Um, by this point, 
he decided that he'd had enough of the United States and what he wanted was to go back to Greenland. So he, he was petitioning Peary to get him back to Greenland and Peary was basically just ignoring him. Um, eventually, excuse me. Eventually as the media circus got greater and greater and it was beginning to look very critical of Peary, um, Josephine, his wife, relented. So this is in 1909. Peary is in the Arctic trying for the last time to get to the North Pole. So he's out of the picture. And Josephine relents and says, raises the money to get Minnick on board a ship that's going up to meet the Peary expedition as it's on its way home in 1909. So finally, in 1909, Minnick gets back to Greenland. He's been away for mo you know all of his youth really he's missed he's forgotten his language because he's been speaking english for 12 years he's um he's missed those crucial years when his the other young men his age are learning how to be um hunters to drive dog teams to paddle kayaks and things like that he's missed out on all of that he's learned to read and write and all the kinds of things an American boy would have learned in those years. And he's had some outdoor experience in the woods of upstate New York, but he has not learned the kinds of skills he needs to survive in the Arctic. But he goes back and he doesn't really recognize individuals necessarily. He doesn't, you know, he, he's an orphan. He didn't have any siblings or even aunts and uncles that I'm aware of to greet him. But people remembered him and they embraced him and they welcomed him back into the community. And he did amazingly well. These photographs are from 1913, 1914, um, taken by Donald McMillan on the Crockerland expedition. So from nine, between 1909 and 1913, in those four years, Minnick relearned the language. He learned how to be a hunter. He learned how to kayak, um, all the kinds of skills that to drive dog teams, to be a hunter, all of those things. He did relearn them and he was um, he was managing. Even he'd been um, kind of taken under the wing of Uta, who was one of the most important men in the community who had worked for Peary, who'd gone on the North Pole dash with Peary. Um, so he was he was getting good instruction on how to live in the Arctic and he'd really made a lot of progress and he was doing really, really well. And so in 1913, Donald McMillan shows up with the Crockerland Expedition, which was um, ironically sponsored by the American Museum of Natural History. But he comes across Minnick and here's a guy who is fluent in English and very familiar with the ways of Americans, but who's also fluent now in Inuktitut and fluent in the ways of the people of those community. So he becomes the perfect interpreter and kind of helper for the expedition. And he begins working for the expedition. And you can see the members of all the Americans here at Christmas dinner in 1913. And here's Minnick sitting among them, um, the only Inuk in that crowd. Uh, and he, so he spent a lot of time in those years working for the expedition and really, um, I think those were quite good years for him where he was, um, they were doing lots of dog sledding. They were relying on his skills quite heavily as they learned the language, as all these newcomers to the Arctic learned to manage dogs and do all the other kinds of things that you need to do to survive. Um, and we can actually see here, this is a little film. McMillan had a motion picture camera with him. Hopefully, load. This is just two minutes long. So, this is some of the earliest film that survives from the Arctic. It's from around 1914, Minnick. Uh, and it, this is two minutes that features Minnick and Donald McMillan repairing a dog whip and then Minnick demonstrating and practicing using it. Um, so, here he is sitting, and here's McMillan coming and sitting with him. One thing to notice. This is in the springtime. You can see it's quite warm out. McMillan is just wearing his shirt, not even a sweater. But look at Minnick's footwear. He's wearing the boots he came north in from New York. Uh, 
we know from photographs that he had proper chemics as well. And it's just, it's very intriguing. In fact, for a long time, we weren't sure that this was Minnick, but the boots and showing the film to um, some other more knowledgeable people about, about Minnick, we're, we're sure that that is him now. So they're working on repairing a dog sled and it's not snowing, that's film damage on the film. Or sorry, they're repairing the dog whip. Um, and notice the sled. This is a, a sled Macmillan design. This is not a traditional Inuit sled. And so this is Minnick demonstrating the use of the very, very long dog whip that people use in that community um, because the dogs are far out in front of the sled. And it's important to realize too that there, you have to be very accurate with the whip because you don't actually want to hit the dogs with them, but you want the dogs to know that you could hit them if you wanted to. Um, so you can guide them and encourage them along, but you're not actually hurting them while you're doing it. So that's just a view of Minnick in action, um, in a sense, in, in his element, maybe, but a little bit out of place, uh, as the shoes suggest. So it's not exactly clear why, but as he was working for the expedition, I perhaps because he was reminded of his long, his many years in New York, he, he started to miss New York. Um, he he wanted to trade, as he, I think he told someone, he wanted to trade the Northern Lights for the Lights of Broadway. Um, and although he seemed to be doing well in Greenland, he decided that he would go back to New York um, on one of the ships that was associated with the expedition. So he did lots and lots of work and you can see him here. Um, they're transporting supplies. He corresponded back and forth, arranging work. Uh, with members of the expedition. But in 1916, he sailed back to New York. And he had great plans for um, raising money for another North Pole expedition. He was going to sell what he said was the true story of Cook and Peary that he'd learned from the people in the Arctic. And he was very ambitious and he was very hopeful when he returned to New York. But in 1916, the whole Peary Cook thing had become, become kind of old hat. The press weren't interested in it. He was not successful in convincing people that he should do a second North Pole expedition. He wasn't raising any money. Um, he took a variety of jobs to um, just to keep uh, to keep himself busy, to do some work and to, to survive. And eventually he ended up in all places uh, at a lumbering camp in northern New Hampshire, far away from where he'd intended to be. But nevertheless, apparently, enjoying it. It was winter work. They were doing logging in the wintertime in northern New Hampshire. He seemed to be having a good time over the winter of 1917, 1918. In fact, he stayed over the summer of 1918 with one of the families um, of one of the men that he'd worked with there, Afton Hall, and seemed to be settling in quite nicely. But 1918, as I'm, I'm sure you're all aware, was the flu pandemic. And he sadly in Pittsburgh, New Hampshire died of flu in 1918, far too young, far, far from home, although he seemed to be making a new home there. And so he's buried there in Pittsburgh, New Hampshire. Afton Hall, his friend raised money to buy this, a very small headstone. And people, it's very interesting. People do go and leave things at his grave. I took this about, uh, about five years ago. Um, and there's just this little accumulation of mementos there at his grave. So it's a it's a it's a very sad story. It's hard to find anything um, good to say about it. It's he was betrayed really by everyone, almost everyone that he ever encountered. Um, Peary brought him and the others south with no real plan for getting them home again for what they would do when they were there. He just dumped them on the museum and washed his hands of them. 
the staff of the American Museum of Natural History did their best to support them while they were alive, but then once they died, betrayed them and their survivors by processing their bodies and keeping the bones instead of giving them a proper burial. And the press through all of this really sensationalized it and they publicized the story, but they nobody in the press, none of that press coverage really did anything um, to help him. Eventually, and I'll talk about this a bit more in a minute, eventually in the 90s, the bones were returned to Kanak. So the four people who died in New York, their bones now are in this cemetery in Kanak, the beautiful view of Inglefield Gulf. Um, the aftermath is hard to say. I, I put this photograph in just because to me it makes it, I think he was Perhaps, you know, this was maybe his best time because he was between two worlds. He didn't fit in in New York. He didn't fit in in the Arctic. But at the expedition, he was kind of the ideal intermediary. Um, I like to I like to think anyways that he had a wonderful time, or maybe not wonderful, but a pretty good time working for the expedition. But his story remained essentially unknown. Obviously, in the community, people knew it and didn't forget about him. Um, but the rest of the world, it was long forgotten until 1986 when Ken Harper, a historian here, um, published a book called Give Me My Father's Body about the whole story. So Ken, you see here with his wife, Navarana, his mother-in-law, um, Armanalek, their children, and Miriam McMillan. This is in Owl's Head, Maine. Uh, they came through Maine while they were while um, Ken was researching the book. Ken had learned the story from Amanalik, who was an amazing uh, storyteller and memory keeper for the community. So he'd learned it from his mother-in-law, um, and then done really a ton of research in order to publish, self-publish a book about it. That really, in 1986, finally kind of brought the story back into the consciousness of Western scholarship. You can see it, it was reissued in 2000, Give Me My Father's Body, um, and a second book in Danish by a Danish anthropologist who actually grew up in the community uh, was published also in 1994. Um, it has a slightly different take on it. I have to admit, I have not read it because I don't read Danish, um, but speaking with, with Rolf Gilberg, I understand a, a slightly different perspective on it, but it's still the same story, um, the tragic story of Minnick. So that brought the story to the attention of the West, both in the United States and in Denmark. And I think that in part prompted um, the American Museum, particularly Edmund Carpenter, to have the bones brought back to Hanak so that people, they would be returned to their community. And that is in fact, that was in 1993, and that was one of the first times I'm aware of that a museum returned bones for burial to the community, um, particularly to a community not within the United States. As some of you are probably familiar with NAGPRA, the Native American Graves Repatriation Act. That only applies to, to burial material from the United States. So it would never apply to these um, these people from Greenland, but nevertheless, the museum eventually in 1993 did the right thing and returned them. Um, the other thing that has come out of it is this film. And I, if you're finding this story interesting, I would encourage you to watch this film. It's called The Prize of the Pole, and you can stream it on Vimeo. And I will put afterwards, I'll put the link to that in the chat so you can just copy and paste it. It's a very interesting film in which the director, Stefan Newland, worked with Robert Peary II, who is a great grandson of Robert Peary. I think great. Yeah. Um, and it follows Robert as he explores the story of Minnick. So they came down, they traveled to New York, they looked at you know places where he had lived they went to Pittsburgh they they followed the story of Minnick and they drew some interesting and important comparisons between Minnick's story of someone who ended up between two cultures you know a, an Inuit from Greenland 
but raised as an American child in New York and never really fitting completely in on either side of that. Um, and they drew parallels with that story with Robert's own story because he is of the generation um, of Inuit in Greenland who were sent away to high school in Denmark. And so again, were pulled out of their communities at a very crucial time when they would have been learning the skills of hunters and things like that, that they needed in their community. And they were in Denmark learning literature and history and math. Um, and again, not fitting in, falling between two cultures. And there's a whole generation uh, in Greenland with the residential schools, it's true in the United States, it's true in the Canadian Arctic, it's true in all of these countries where people were pulled away at crucial children were pulled away from their, their cultures at crucial times. And Minnick is kind of the, in a lot of ways, the, the first uh, example of that. Um, so it's, it's important. It's a, it's a very, very sad story. It's an important story. It's important that we remember him, that we understand what, what he went through and that we hopefully learn from that that uh that we can make sure things like that are not happening again and that we can understand the 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 ways in in which that kind of uh behavior challenges people and makes their lives difficult for people anybody to whom that kind of an experience happens so i'm gonna finish with that here's an picture of him back in his kayak again looking happy and I'm happy to answer questions if you have any. Thank you very much. Uh, we are getting questions from the audience. How did Minnick Wallace's story influence public perception of Inuit culture in the early 1900s? Well that's a really good question um, and I, to be honest I don't really know. My My sense is that the public's perception, you know, the, the what the public knew was coming mostly through the newspapers. So whereas, you know, Krober published a scholarly article about Inuit culture, but most people would never have read it. So there was still mostly reading the sensationalist news reports. So to be honest, I don't think they learned much. Um, but and I think that would be a, an interesting thing to look at in more detail, but sure. I have not done Someone else is asking, is anything known about how it was finally exposed about what happened to um, to the remains and the and the bones of those people? Like, do we, how did that come to light, I guess, is the question. Do we know how that happened? My, I'm not sure. My guess is that the, that they had them on exhibit. The museum is very, they don't have really good records of their exhibits back in those days. So it's now hard to say for sure that they were on exhibit. But my guess is that a, a reporter saw them on exhibit and made a story out of it. Sure. Um, either that or heard, perhaps had a friend in the museum who told them they were there, I don't know. But um, my guess is that the reporter, in a sense, stumbled along, stumbled on that information one way or another and then made it, um, sensationalized it, mm -hmm. as they should have. I mean, it needed to be sure. publicized. Yeah. Someone else is asking, um, have you been to that area of Greenland, Greenland, excuse me, um, yes. and do you know what happened to Minnick's American brother, the other Wallace um, boy? Gosh, you know, I don't. I think Ken Harper in his book talks about it, and I can't remember what he says. Um, I, But yes, I've been there. I've done a fair bit of research in that community. I've done some historical sort of oral history work in the community with photographs many years ago and then I've done a lot of archaeological work in the community as well. Excellent. So um, I did share the link if folks are interested in visiting uh, the Perry McMillan Arctic Museum. Um, can you tell us just real quick a little bit about like your hours like when when can people come visit? Oh, sure. yeah. Um, yeah so um, we're open Tuesday through Saturday from 10 until 5 and Sunday from 1 until 5. We're free all the time. Um, and we do have, we will have weird hours around the holidays. So sure. it's always a good idea to check the website. But by and large, we're open all the time and we welcome all comers. It's great. It's a good place to bring family. Kids love it. Uh, 
And let's see, I'm just going to put in the chat. Can I send it? I'm going to put in the chat to everyone the link to that video if you want sure. to watch. Thank you. There we go. Um, Excellent. <laughs> yeah, and we're you and people may not realize if they've been to the museum before that we're in a new building. We have our new beautiful building on the Bowdoin campus. It's a 10 polar loop. If you put that into your GPS, you'll find us. Excellent. Yeah. And just a reminder too. So some of the images that you shared with us, you know, in your talk um, are of things that are on display right now um, at Code Red. Um, yes. yes. And this and Code of the exhibit is actually where I first learned um, about this story. So it's a story that, that's featured uh, as part of the exhibit too. Thank you so much um, for uh, sharing your, your time and your expertise with us, Genevieve. Is there anything else that you wanted to say um, before we before we close this evening? Um, no, I thanks for listening and for asking good questions. Some of them I'm going to have to do more work on <laughs> to answer more thoroughly. But yeah, thank you. It's been a great pleasure. And I would encourage you, if you haven't already go, gone to see the exhibit, I would definitely encourage people to go see it. It's a terrific exhibit. Well, thank you very much. And uh, again, thank you for the talk. And thank you so much to our audience for being here. I hope we'll see everyone again here soon. Our final Code Red program uh, will be a talk between Bill McKibben and our executive director, Steve Bromage. That will also be a Zoom program, and that is scheduled for November 30th, uh, 7 p.m. Eastern time. So that should be really, that should be a really good one. And um, hope everyone can join us again soon. So take care, everybody.